Good morning. As it was said that I definitely come from a country which doesn't have a simple passing interest on the subject of, of climate change. The Maldives is, must be one of those countries which does most of the effort to mitigate the effects of climate change on all global fronts. So these days, I make it a point not to miss any opportunity to talk about climate change and to advocate to mitigate climate change and to find a global agreement for mitigating climate change. It's not an easy task. We're not there yet. There's a long, long way to go. We've had many failures in the past. But we haven't given up the hope. I'm sure we all know that in the Earth's very long geological past, it has seen many changes. The Earth has undergone many, many climatic changes. We have seen continents shifting, new oceans forming, older oceans closing, Spe species evolving and extincting, ex extinction. These are all things that have ha had happened in the geological past of our Earth. But until recently, all of those events, all of the, those changes, can be solely attributed as a result of natural causes. At around 1800s, when we started industri industri industrialization, it's a difficult word for, me to, word for me to say even, things have started changing. And the biggest change is the amount of the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Prior to that, the Earth's atmosphere had carbon concentration of around 270 parts per million. It is now said that the Earth's atmospheric concentration of carbon is 380 parts per million. In 2009, we ran a big campaign, the 350 campaign. Even at that time, we've already reached that level, and we are way beyond that. According to some scientists, we've already reached the threshold. It's just a matter of time the, the Earth's natural system will respond to this change we have brought to the Earth's atmosphere. And it is going to affect some of us, or most of us. In fact, I believe it is going to affect all of us. What has been done is going to have effects. And for some, the effects may be smaller than the others. But I have no doubt in my mind that everyone will be affected. For some, it's an existential threat. For the others, it's a threat to their economies, to their way of life. I do not want to say that we do not enjoy the developments and the achievements we've made since the Industrial Revolution. We all enjoy that. We do not want to go back 
to the Stone Ages. We want to have a good life. We want to be able to travel as efficiently as we do now. There's not a place on Earth from where you can't travel to anywhere else on Earth within 24 hours. No place is too warm. No place is too hot. We can be very comfortably warm in the coldest environments on Earth and we can keep ourselves cool in the hottest environment on Earth. We have extended the day into, into the night. The working hours are no longer just restricted to the 12 hours of daylight. It's 24 hours. We have made many advancements, many, many. In medicine, in transport, name it. You can name anything. You can go on and on with this list. And we want to maintain these comforts. We want to live this way of life. But we want it to be sustainable. That's what we want. We are not telling anyone to give up the good life and not to do things that they've been doing. But we all know the path we took since the Industrial Revolution to achieve all of these things is now threatening this very way of life, and it might even, to the extinction of many species on Earth, and ultimately affecting us. So what are we supposed to do? Governments around the world know this. People know about it. But unfortunately, for the past at least two years, I've been involved in this. I have been seeing that the governments are failing to find a solution to this. Cancun wasn't a big success. Copenhagen wasn't a big success either. In fact, to the minds of, of many people, Copenhagen was a big failure. But because all the global leaders were there, they decided to come up with a decision within the last 24 hours of that conference. And so they did. But it hasn't made any difference, any change to what we were trying to do. I am not very hopeful of Durban either. I do not believe that we can resolve the issues of climate change with an agreement from the governments. I do not believe it's our leaders who will be able to do that. I believe if it can be done, it can only be done with the passion of the people. The people must realize that this issue needs to be resolved. It must become an election issue. People should elect leaders who have got the courage to face this issue and to deal with it. This is not, as a, this is not an easy task. A lot of countries will have to open up themselves, share their technologies. They have to find alternative ways of doing things.
the recent events in Japan said it is has made some countries realize that the way they do things needs to change. And I'm glad that the Germans have decided to phase out nuclear energy. And I hope they will be on the path of renewable. Up till now, with climate negotiations, we've been talking about not doing things. We've been saying, cut down the emission by so much amount. Don't do that. Don't do this. I think if we can, if we can change the narrative, it might be easier to deal with this. Instead, I think we should be saying, you should invest so much in renewable energies. You should invest in so much with green economic development. And then maybe when we adopt the sums, we might reach a figure that would take us to the target we want to reach. And I hope the global community will find a solution to this before it's too late to the Maldives and many other small island states around the world. There are some 52 small island developing states, but there's a very special category among those 52. There are five nations, four, which is, has sovereign governments, that comprises entirely of low-lying coral islands. The Maldives, Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, and Kiribati. We are not large populations. The Maldives is the largest of those in terms of population, 315,000 people. The other three are less than 100,000, 200,000. But we are entirely small, low-lying, coralline islands, which rises no more than a meter or two above the sea level. One of the biggest effects when we talk about climate change is the effects the rise in seas. And the predictions made for the sea level rise with climate change during this century, if you just take the numbers, the amount of rise and the height at which these islands sit, it becomes obvious that these islands cannot survive above the water level with that sort of a change. A 50 centimeter or a meter rise in sea is going to submerge, theoretically, most of these islands. Now that, I believe, is an oversimplification of things. I think sometimes when we talk about island nations sinking with the rise in seas, people then ask the question, oh, hang on, if that is the case, why do you want to live there? Why do you want to make plans for your development? Why don't you just start making plans to migrate somewhere else? It's not that simple. The islands are part of the natural system. And like any other natural system, when it is externally forced, it responds to that force. It will try to readjust itself. It will fight back. That's what nature does. 
So the islands probably, most of them probably will survive as landforms above water, at least up to a certain threshold beyond which I don't think anybody can predict what's going to happen. But before we start thinking, before we start talking about the doomsday, we should talk about what lies before that. The Maldives have existed as a group of islands for at least the last 5,000 years. People have lived on those islands for at least 2,000 years. We have a history, a written history, of the last 1,000 years. Small we may be, but we have a history. We have an identity. We have a culture. We have attachments to these islands. This is where we call home. Number one, we do not want to be relocated to somewhere else, let alone going to another country. Most of us don't even want to move from the island that they have, their forefathers have lived to the next neighboring island. It's not that simple. Often people talk about, <clears throat> why don't you just move that population, it's just 1,000 people, to the next island, which is a bigger one, provide them with better opportunities, with economies of scale. It's not that simple. We are people. We are not trees. You can't just pluck us and then plant us somewhere else. It's more complex than that. So what do we do? We haven't given up the hope. We believe we can deal with this. But we are not naive to think that climate change and the effects of climate change is a myth. We accept it. We want to face it. And we want to prepare ourselves for the challenging future. Now, I said, I want to say this. I don't know how many of you in this room are climate skeptics. I don't think any one of you will be. But if there is anyone, or if you meet anyone, I think you must tell them that if you want to see if you are in doubt of climate change and the effects of climate change on small island states and many other states, in fact, all the states. Just have a look at the four island states I've just mentioned. You can see the effects on the ground right now as we speak. So these four island states are like the canaries in the coal mine. You can see the effects happening now. About time you believe that. Do something about it. If you can't save us, ultimately you can't save yourself either. We have seen in the Maldives in the past two, three decades, we have relocated entire populations from one island to the other, Slim simply because life wasn't sustainable on those islands. As it was said that we may not be able to attribute the causes of that, all of it, to climate change as an obvious case. But it had happened, and it is happening. In the recent times, at least in the last 
five, six years, for which I have data. We are seeing island communities running out of fresh water. I grew up my entire life in the Maldives, come from a very small island, just a thousand people, that's where I was born, stand on one end of the island, and if I shout, the person on the other end of the island can hear me clearly. As a child, I don't remember us having any problems with fresh water. We didn't have much storage for rainwater at the time. We relied entirely on groundwater. These islands don't have subterranean water reservoirs, not much. There's a thin film beneath the feet, but it was enough for us to sustain ourselves, just a thousand, two thousand people on these islands, and it worked. For the last six years, we have been supplying fresh drinking water to at least 100 islands every year during the dry northeast monsoon. Imagine somebody without drinking water even for a day. This wasn't a situation we had in the past. It's new to us. We are seeing many islands eroding. We are having to put expensive coast, coastal shore protection structures around the most populous islands in the country. We are seeing the soil chemistry changing and not being able to grow what we used to grow on these islands. But if one look at things, one might see the total land area of the Maldives haven't changed much, at least. It remains almost con constant. So one might argue and say, look, hang on, you're there, you're still there, your land is rem area remains constant. So you, you do not need to worry about it. With the effects of climate change, with the rise in seas, and with the dynamics of the islands, we humans, we who live on these islands, are finding life very difficult and very expensive. When we don't have fresh groundwater, we have to produce water through very expensive means. Desalination. Desalinating seawater is an expensive business. And that's what we are doing on the capital of the Maldives. That's what we are doing on many populous islands in the Maldives. So we need to deal with it. We need to, be, we need to build our capacity to do that. The bottom line is, we're not going to leave these islands. We are not going to leave these islands. This will be our home as it was for the, last, for the past many generations. So we will fight to stay on these islands. And to do that, to increase our resilience to these effects, we need to do many things. We need to be independent, uh, capable of doing things ourselves. We need to be, we need to have energy security. 
We need to build our economy to be able to produce water from, through desalination. We need to have enough economic strength to find alternative ways, means of growing vegetables and fruits. Technology does exist. So we need to, we need to stay on the path of economic development. We need to plan ourselves to find, to understand which islands are naturally more resilient than the others, which groups of islands, which communities to fight back and start concentrating on the development on those areas. And that's what the government of Maldives is doing. And that's what we will continue to do. Economic development and good governance is central to deal with the effects of climate change. I've read in an article recently that the Maldives has the highest vulnerability index to the effects of rising seas. And the way this index is calculated, the factors that were taken into account were the coastline length, length to the land area, the population density, and the GDP of the country. Increase the GDP, your vulnerability declines. The other three, the other two, we can't change, not much at least. We can't increase the land area. We can, we can increase it a bit by artificial means. We cannot, and, and since we can't increase the area, we can't decrease the density, the, the population density. So the only thing we can change to reduce our vulnerability is to increase our GDP, which is economic development. And to do that, and to increase our resilience, we need to have our community, communities participating in the decision-making process. As I said, that it's not easy to move a community from one place to the other. It requires people's consent. It requires people to accept it, agree on that. So they must be part of the decision-making process. Therefore, good governance is important for that to be successful. And at the same time, economic development is essential for us to be able to adapt for the challenging future. The Maldives is not going to give up. We're not going to sink beneath the waves. We will survive as a nation for many, many generations to come. And I thank you very much for the invitation to address you. Thank you. Thank you very much.